Those of you that know me here might think that I'm here to talk about business or leadership because that's what I usually talk about, but I'm not. I'm here today to talk to you about significance. Now, the earliest memory that I have of thinking about this was when I was cycling home from school one day. I was about 15 or 16 years old. And I was cycling along with my friends, as I usually did, taking the normal route. And on this case, we were two abreast. And my best friend beside me said, Joanne, I need to talk to you about something. I think I'm getting a calling. I think I'm getting a calling to join the nuns. And thankfully, I kept one hand on my handlebars as I turned to her and I said, what? Like from up there? Are you serious? And she said, I think so. Now, as it turns out, it didn't seem like she was getting a calling from the nuns because she went on to study law, became a policewoman, got married and had two beautiful children. But it started me thinking about this question. What am I here for? What's my significance? I left school, went to college, and my 20s were pretty frenetic as I changed jobs a number of times, really looking to find meaning before behind what I was doing. And it was when I was working for a large multinational that you'd all know I had a great career laid out ahead of me, a professional qualification that I was getting under my belt, smart, interesting people that I was working with, not to mention the salary that I was going to earn. Many people would have said I had it made. But it was that question that was niggling at me again. Is this what I'm here for? Is this my significance? Now, my late 20s and my 30s, this question got buried. To be honest, I really didn't have time to think about it. I founded two successful businesses, got married, built a house, and had three very beautiful children. So it was when I was 37 that again this question popped up for me. I found myself sitting on my own in a restaurant, notebook on the table, pen in hand, and I was writing my epitaph. I wasn't sick, I wasn't ill, I wasn't about to die. But I had got so busy I'd buried that question and it was nudging at me to ask myself, is this what I'm here for? Is this my significance? I imagined myself as I was sitting in that restaurant. Imagine if I did die, if I walked into my funeral now and I was able to sit in the front pew and watch everybody come in. What would my husband, my parents, my close friends, my colleagues, what would they say about me? And the harsh reality struck me as I thought, I know what they'd all say about me. They'd say, whew, she worked very hard. And that was the reality. I thought to myself, that's not what I'm here for. That is not my significance. Now, I wonder how many other people have thought about this question. Maybe some of you have thought about it too. So I did a search on Amazon to see how many books have been written about purpose in life. It turns out that over 30,000 books have been written on this topic. I also put into the search bar of Google to see research on significance in life, and over 8 billion results come up. I think it's probably the first time in my life that I'm actually on trend with this. <laughs> now, when I was 25, I left my parents' very comfortable home in Dublin in Ireland, and I traveled 7,000 miles to the Rwandan border in East Africa. I left my home, I left my family, I left my friends, I left my job to work in the refugee camps after the Rwandan genocide, the horrible, horrific genocide that many of you will remember in the mid-1990s. I found it hard when I was there. I was challenged. My skills were challenged, my abilities were challenged, my character was challenged. I felt like my brain was going to burst. My brain was being pulled from left to right, like it was being stretched, like I was trying to deal with all of the decisions and really alien situation that I was in. 
But whatever the hardship that I found myself in, it was only a tiny fraction of the hardship that all of those people that had been driven out of their homes in Rwanda and had traveled for miles for fear of being killed and had ended up to where I was in the safety of the refugee camps. They'd travel for miles, they'd come across the border and we would give them a few poles and a plastic sheet to get set up in home. Now home was a hut about five feet by six feet in diameter and it was made up of these wooden poles and plastic sheets. Life in the camps was hard. There was poverty, there was loss, there was tragedy, and there was corruption. Basic essentials were just about there. Teenage girls didn't even have sanitary supplies. We wouldn't even dream of that in the West now. Women were giving birth to babies, not in hospitals, not in beds, but on hard mud floors, and then getting up straight after to go back to the duties that they needed to. Families were not only housed in really small areas, but were sharing toilets with each other. And sometimes, even though it wasn't supposed to be the case, sometimes up to 10 families were sharing the one toilet. It was a latrine, not the sit-down kind like we all know, but a hole in the ground, a meter wide and a couple of meters deep. I mean, just think about that for a second. Imagine sharing a toilet like that with nine other families in your neighborhood. It was tough. Now, I'd love to be telling you that this was a moment of epiphany for me that I realized my significance, that I realized what my purpose was when I was there. But that's not the reality. What I saw were people in dire situations trying to make the very best of what they could. People with very little choice, doing whatever they could to make life better for themselves, their families, and their communities. I struggled. I struggled knowing that the choices that I had were very different to theirs. My choices were different to theirs simply because of the circumstances with, of my birth. There are things I struggle with still today. But significance, working it all out, that I didn't do there. It seems that this has been a bit of a slow burn for me. After 51 years... I've come to the simplest of conclusions about this. It really just boils down to one very simple thing. Significance is found in everything that we do. Everything that we do affects other people. Real significance is not, though, in what we do. It's in how we do it. Like Porrick O'Callaghan, the 11-year-old boy who shares his love of the world with everybody through his positive podcast that comes out every Monday morning. Or Brigitte, the CEO for 20 years, who thinks about not only the people she works with, but her suppliers and her customers with the respect and empathy that everybody deserves. Or Faustine, that Tanzanian man that I worked with while I was in Rwanda, who held his integrity all of the time, despite monumental corruption. It would have benefited him hugely not to have upheld that. Financially, it would have been very good to, for him. But he didn't. He always upheld it. And the thousands of people that I met in those camps that despite the hardship that they had, owned and accepted their situation with a grace and dignity like no other. Or Doreen, aged 83, who lives her life with a couple of really simple principles. In essential things, Doreen says, let's get unity in this. In things that aren't that, es that essential, she goes, let's liberate people and let's lift them up. 
And in everything else, she thinks first and foremost, it's important to love everybody else. And that's how she lives. It's not what we do in life, it's how we do it. I am just one person in this big little country, but together we all make up our whole population and we make up our culture. Let's together choose to be really significant today. Thank you.